I launched the Smart Mobility Initiative, which really was the driver to the Smart Mobility Corridor on US 33. That's a four-lane divide, divided highway that basically um, connects the Ohio State University with Transportation Research Center. So I thought we have two hubs. We can do contained research, and then we have a way to do on-the-road validation of that as well. Not knowing how to do that well, I ended up creating an external advisory board, Smart Mobility External Advisory Board. And I called in people from ODOT and the City of Columbus, the Economic Development, Jobs Ohio, anybody that was a stakeholder in any way. Fortunately, I had a good friend that came from the government side and could introduce me to all the, all the, the people that needed to be included. And we brainstormed how to make this happen. Because we had no funding, we had no way to realize this, nor did we really have a justification for why it was important. At the end of the day, we put together a proposal to put fiber along 33, also build a smart center at TRC, which will be about 500 acres just for connected autonomous vehicle research. The cities that surrounded the corridor were not Columbus, they were Dublin and Marysville. Marysville is a bedroom community, kind of exurban. People live there because they can't usually afford a house in, in Columbus, so they move out to Marysville, very rural. Um, I actually was able to get those two jurisdictions plus the counties to pony up the money to take the fiber from the center of Columbus out to TRC, 35 miles of, carbon, of optic fiber. That was great. And then ODOT said, wait a minute, we own that right away. So then ODOT said, we'll pay. Great, great. That, that gave us a little extra money. So then we went ahead and applied for an ATC MTD grant from the government to put in the remaining infrastructure, which we also won $6 million. This is a separate initiative from Smart City Challenge that started first. So putting together this external advisory board, bringing together the stakeholders, it was amazing what we could do once we put our minds to it and got a plan together and also created the economic strategy that convinced the cities and the counties in that area that it was the right thing to do. I'll explain more about that later. Another um, thing that, that I put together was the Smart Buck Coalition. And, and this, I just want to talk to you a little bit about how ideas can make things happen. So I knew a little bit about what Michigan was working on, that's where I got my graduate degree. I know what uh, Ohio State's capabilities were. I also had a good friend at Carnegie Mellon, and I knew their capabilities and some of the great things they were doing in smart mobility. So the three of us met, the, the three uh, professors from the different universities, and said, wouldn't it be great if we created corridors between us for um, freight and goods movement? We have the ability to, we have different uh, um, infrastructures, we have great, we have bad weather, differing weather conditions, so we can really make great corridors between the states. So we said, yeah, we need to do this, great research opportunities, great for our students. So then we, I asked them both, I said, well, do you think you can get MDOT, PennDOT, the Turnpike, and I'll get ODOT, and the Ohio Turnpike will have a meeting. So I corralled these people and got them all on one conference call. We talked for an hour about our idea of what this was going to be. And nobody was arguing that it was a bad idea. So at the end of the call, I said, so was everybody in or are you out? And they all said, we're in. And then from there, the Pennsylvania Turnpike hired a consultant, and we were able to put together our governance structure, and we announced this about a, a, about a year ago, that we're going to create these corridors for freight and goods movement starting here, and then moving out to New York and then into um, Chicago, which is the main route of goods that are coming in from the, from the seaport. When we look at what's happening in e-commerce, if we don't start doing more truck platooning and autonomous trucking, we simply are running out of drivers. So even though there's a, a big risk, or people are perceiving it as a risk for the current drivers, actually we don't have enough today. We don't have enough trained drivers. The turnover in most of the freight companies today is almost 100%. Um, just stealing drivers for, for better pay or better benefits. 
So these are some of the things that preceded then the Smart City Challenge was announced by the DOT. And we had already started these, and the DOT said, you know, we want to do this to reduce congestion, improve ladders of opportunity, basically everything that we were trying to already do with these initiatives. So again, it was very similar, calling together the right group of people. We spent eight hours in a brainstorming session and then created the proposal. I'll go into more details in a minute on that. So to give you a little bit of background, I mentioned we sat for eight hours. What we started with, the Mid-Ohio Regional Planning Commission, better known as MORPSI, had done a study called Insight 2050. At the time they did that study, we expected about another million people coming into the Columbus area by 2050. Now we think it's going to be by 2030. And the Columbus area is right today about 800,000 people. So we're going to double our size in a very short amount of time. So Morpsey looked at several different business ways to handle that kind of growth. And it basically, as, as a community, it was decided to select the way that didn't create more urban sprawl, didn't enlarge the infrastructure, and revitalize the downtown, which meant we had to use the infrastructure that we have much more efficiently. So we looked at that 2050 plan, and we looked at where we were today, and we said, what are the biggest problems we face to realize that vision in 2050? Based on those problems, then, we address those and the mobility solutions corresponding to those when we did our application for the Smart City Challenge. So if you look at the outer ring, prosperous, beautiful, healthy, that's probably the worst vision statement ever. You know, it, it's very generic. Every city probably says this is what we want to be. But anyway, it, it looks good on paper. So we really wanted to make access equitable and available to all. So I'm going to walk around a, a few of the, the areas that we selected. The first one is access to jobs. First of all, all we have in Columbus today is a bus system. A bus system that is often unreliable and to go maybe five, six miles you'll be on the bus for an hour, hour and a half by the time you change buses and, and deal with you know, all of the other issues. And typically the people utilizing the buses are those that are working minimum wage jobs and they can't afford to be late. They're late a couple times that their job is gone. So the first thing we said was we want to put in a bus rapid transit line that goes from the north to the south and goes straight through some of our underserved communities in the city. So we're actually going to be starting that this fall. We'll have six buses running along a route and uh, they will be timed to the traffic signal so they don't have to stop and you can get from north to south in a very reasonable amount of time, about 20 minutes. Now, that also means, because we don't have segregated bus lanes, that we have to be smart enough to know how many cars are in front of us so that the light can change appropriately. There's technology that exists to allow us to do that. We're starting it on one artery, and then we'll expand it to other arteries throughout the city. Secondly, smart logistics. We have one of the largest inland ports in the country. Columbus is located 500 miles or a day's drive from 55% of the U.S. population. So we have a lot of goods and freight coming in and out of there. And I, I mentioned earlier, you know, freight companies are struggling with drivers, but beyond that, they also have very low profit margins. And if you miss your delivery window, Sometimes you have to sit and wait up to eight to 10 hours to be able to unload. And that is just dollars pouring out of the freight companies, um, low profit margins to begin with. So we're starting with very simple truck platooning. Two trucks connected, connected to the, to the traffic lights, connected on the freeways to be able to reduce or improve the efficiency of delivery, but also improve the fuel economy. We can get anywhere from 8 to 10% fuel economy savings um, by utilizing truck platooning, just by shortening the distance between the trucks. The third area was the ladders of opportunity connected citizens. We have an area in Columbus called Linden, and this is one of the, there, there are a couple others, but this is probably 
um, the one that needs to be focused and improved the most. It's an area of 32,000 people. There's not a single doctor in that area. There, is, there are no grocery stores. It's a food desert. It is also a, a transit desert. There are only a couple bus stops, and those are not easy to walk to, and, you, and there is nothing there except a pole that says this is where the stop is. You can't sit. There's no coverage in the elements. We have four times the national average of infant mortality in this community. We have a group called Celebrate One, just to celebrate those babies that do make it to see their first birthday. And if you are born in this area, you have less than a 20% chance of escaping to another social level. So knowing this, we, we thought we had this pretty well figured out. We're going to put in Wi-Fi hotspots. We're going to put in sidewalk lab kiosks to help with first mile, last mile. We're going to put in some sort of first mile, last mile solutions. And that was all in our proposal. And we still intend to do some of that. But we actually spent that time in that community talking um, with, with the various residents of the community center. And we learned a lot. And I was talking with one lady about first mile, last mile. And she interrupted me after I'd been talking a little while, and she goes, I don't really know what you're talking about, first mile, last mile. But she said, I hear gunshots every day. I don't even want to leave my house. I don't care what you provide me. So you have to understand the problem. So even if I were to provide what I thought was a great solution, she just told me, no, it's not going to work until you solve this other problem. So again, it's really understanding. And as we were talking to, to the people in the community, we realized maybe they don't need to leave their house right away, but maybe we need to provide mobile health units for them or mobile grocery stores for them, at least until we can bring in the doctors and the grocery stores really what the community needs till we, till we really can manage the economic growth. So it's a little bit different than we thought, but we're still proceeding on. And we actually have a group that is engaged solely in the infant mortality issue because there's more than just a prenatal care issue happening in that neighborhood. And we need to address all of those issues. The next thing was uh, connected visitors. We have a lot of events. Ohio State football games is one that completely clogs up the city. And, uh, we don't have a good way to route the traffic. We don't have real-time traffic information. We don't provide smart parking solutions, which, to be very honest, I'm not an advocate of smart parking because I don't want parking garages at all. But um, at least in the short term, yes, we do need to let people know where there's places to park. So it's providing that kind of infrastructure. In the last part, we did get another $10 million from Vulcan, Paul Allen's foundation, to increase the number of EVs in the city four times uh, to put in charging stations and also to clean up our grid. So in a nutshell, that was the proposal. Now, the background, or the kind of the backbone for everything we're going to do is what we call the integrated data exchange. <laughs> We have the supercomputer that exists within the whole, whole society of Ohio, it's 200 gigabits, or net. And that is, that is the foundation for the integrated data exchange. The idea is to take any way that you can get around Columbus today, be it bike sharing programs, the bus system, Uber, Lyft, Yellow Cab, um, your feet. Um, and, and really have people say, I want to go A to B. You don't even account with all those places. You just want to go from A to B. And here's your options that are available. There's the cheapest option, the quickest option, you know, kind of like when you get an airplane, the healthiest option. And if I have my way for that healthy option, it's going to connect to your Fitbit, and it's going to tell you, by the way, your goal today is 10,000. You're at 1500 you might want to take the healthy option. And by the way, I checked your calendar, and you have time to do it. So, you know, really walking and biking options need to be there. But it'll just tell you that you can go from A to B, and then there'll be a common payment system. So you don't have to have an account set up with each of those providers either. You just need to have one mobility account, and then the back room will sort who needs to be paid based on the option that you actually took. 
Along with that, we're putting in um, all the EV infrastructure that I mentioned, common payment, smart Columbus operating, it's all there. I don't need to review it again. I'll, I'll save a little bit of time. So what are really the inputs or, or the outputs that we're expecting? First of all, mobility and access for all, removing the barriers. One thing that I did neglect to mention, I, I mentioned about people with um, disabilities and, and that includes cognitive disabilities. We are creating a Wayfinder app that has been very successful in other cities for people with cognitive disabilities that allows them to utilize public transit versus paratransit. Paratransit is not a friendly way to get around a city. It's not a friendly way to have to live um, based on um, all the requirements in terms of when you have to reserve it, the window of time you're allocated, and for newly disabled people, I, I simply think a lot of times they don't understand how long it's going to take them and, and their device does not communicate with the person picking them up. So we are creating an app for people with cognitive disabilities, which basically gives them a pictorial step-by-step -step way to get from wherever they live to, to the transit station so they can utilize public transit. In other cities that have deployed it, Barcelona is the best example, they've been able to reduce paratransit by 85%, so enabled 85% of people with cognitive disabilities to utilize public transit. I was in Barcelona for the Smart City World Expo last November, and I went to, the, to um, this company that developed it, and I followed a lady. She was probably 30 years old, but maybe had the brain capacity, I would say about 12, 13 year old. And I walked with her from her facility down and spent the day with her doing her errands on public transit, and the app was amazing. And if she were to go off, grid and we asked her to go off grid and she really didn't want to do that she was well trained um, she just had to go a short distance before the back room saw what was going on and immediately began to direct her back and if she were to stay off grid for a little bit longer then intervention would have happened there's a way to make that happen but again it's all about mobility and access for all providing a green healthy sustainable environment when we talk, I talked a little bit about urban planning and having everything connected. Today, we design our, our cities around our roadways. It's the way we've done it forever. And we need to really turn that completely upside down. Let's make cities for what the citizens need. Let's make them walkable, livable. Places where back in the day, why did cities start? They started so that you could have town hall meetings, so you could have the community getting together talking about things, working together as a community. That's why cities were born. But today, nobody does that because you all in your own individual cars alone, driving here or there, and nobody communicates like they need to anymore. So let's make the city like a city used to be. And then let's find the most efficient way to bring in goods and, and people into our neighborhoods. And let's get the businesses equally is involved with the uh, planning agencies. We're going to have a ton of data that's going to come out of this. We've all heard petabytes of data. I've heard zettabytes of data. I mean, it, some of it's valuable, some of it's not. We're going to need to sort that out. We're going to need to make sure it's, it's, it's secure and protected. But we need to utilize the data in all of these pilot programs. And the pilots are very small. We need to utilize the data, understand are we making the changes that we thought we would when we made the proposal, and then hone it in, hone it in, and then begin to enlarge the scope. This I'm not going to review. These are some of our local partners, and this shows the breadth of, of the companies that were involved. So, and it's a global scope. We have the university, we have the Columbus Partnership, Columbus Partnership is a group of the largest companies, about 50 CEOs, that meet on a regular basis. And they became some of our greatest cheerleaders um, when, we, when we made the proposal. We had to have their buy-in because they were, they were the group that was um, enabling us to put in the, uh, some of the autonomous shuttles. I did miss one important part of the 
of the grant, and that was um, an area called Easton, which is an area that is a big shopping complex, outdoor pedestrian area, big entertainment complex. It has several businesses in the area. El Brands is, is headquartered there. There are 32,000 people that come in and out of that area on a daily basis just for work. About 65,000 people come in and out of that area every day, including the transients. It's serviced today by one interchange off the freeway. So if you're there during rush hour, you can imagine the bad behavior that happens. It's amazing how badly people behave when they're, they feel like they're behind the wheel of a car. Um, and we were, what the plan was to put in an entire new interchange to service this area. For those of you in that business, you know that's a very expensive proposition. So we've actually put that plan on ice and we're putting in six autonomous shuttles in that area linked to a major transit hub. This transit hub is linked to the bus rapid transit so that we can enable people to get out of their single, single passenger vehicles and utilize public transit. With these shuttles, and we'll have them going on a prescribed route, they are going to be intermingled with dumb traffic, vehicles that aren't communicating. They are going to be communicating with the traffic signals, and they will be running on a frequent basis. But, but before we decide the route and decide the frequency, we're going and we're talking to the occupants that are working in that area to try to understand what their problems are and how we can best address those. Until we have a seamless solution for people to give up their personal mobility security blanket, their car, until we have a seamless solution that allows them to live their lives the way they want to live it, they will not change their behavior. So we need to really understand what the needs are before we put in these shuttles and hope to change behavior. Then you also have to think about what would be the incentives or what would be the, the do we want to use carrots, do we want to use a stick? Both might have to be used in some ways. You can't always be nice if you're going to solve this problem. We also were given certain partners from the US DOT, which have been amazing to work with. These were prescribed as part of the grant. The only one at this stage that we're probably not going to be utilizing is sidewalk labs, because the kiosk idea, we don't want to have scientific monuments. And so far, what we've heard from, the, from our citizens is they're not going to be valued. So we'll probably give up that solution, but the rest we're utilizing their technology. So I mentioned about this um, area that was developed initially. This was the first part of the Columbus Smart Mobility Initiative. Up in the upper left-hand corner is the Transportation Research Center. You can see geographically how this was laid out. And then this is the corridor that exists. And these are the companies that currently exist along the corridor today. Since we have announced that this, this particular road will be utilized for smart mobility um, uh, R&D, research and development, the city of Marysville, which I mentioned, the, the, the bedroom community, has now decided that they're going to make a technology park in their city. And uh, several companies, I think it's almost full now, and it hasn't even started the groundbreaking. They also now have a STEM high school, which is doing some amazing robotic work uh, in partnering with, uh, with uh, Honda and other businesses in the area. So that we really are trying to make this very holistic, not just for TRC, not just for the companies, but we want every aspect of the community to be involved. We're also bringing in the community college, we need to have um, the, the particular work skills to be able to work on the infrastructure and manage that. Very holistic, bringing everybody involved. And this is the key. Everybody has to be involved. Everybody has to feel a benefit. The Smart Belt, I mentioned, this shows it even better. And we've already had outreach from Indiana, Wisconsin, Ontario strongly wants to work with us on this because 
what's going to happen when an autonomous truck tries to cross the border? It's not going to have a passport to show, but we're going to have to figure that out. Um, and uh, not only we have Pennsylvania involved, um, New Jersey has reached out, New York and Maryland, and of course several other universities. Now at this point, I'm a big advocate in starting slow and doing things properly. So we're going to keep it just with the three states for now until we can start having some success, build some momentum, understand better how it's going to work, and then we'll move it into the other regions. So how did we do it? Yeah, I went through a lot of this already. I, I don't think I'll go through it again, but I can't stress enough the importance for the, the public-private sector um, agreement and working together and for the involvement of the businesses. It's really critical that the businesses understand that, that they, they shouldn't just be asking the infrastructure team to fix the problem. We can't get people to come to work. Please, you know, find a way that you can remove the traffic jams and do something in the infrastructure. It doesn't work that way. We have to work together. In a lot of the, the countries that, that I worked with at, at Nissan, and I'll give the example of Rio, we built a manufacturing plant in Brazil, and part of the package for every employee was guaranteed transit. That was part of the package. Because there was no reliable way for people to get to work every day, and we needed them there every day working. We wanted to be able to, to um, make sure they were there and had a safe way to get to work. It's part of their package. This is not unusual. It's done in many, many countries. What we're talking about now in Columbus, to get rid of some of the congestion that we have, there are companies that want to do this, want to provide a ride-sharing service or something for, the, for their employees, but they don't have the bandwidth to, to afford it on their own. So we're trying to bundle businesses, maybe five or six in a similar geographic area, to then be able to provide these kinds of services. There are a lot of new companies like Split is a good example of doing B2B. It's a startup that will work and, and provide these rides for your employees. There are many, many more that are coming and crowdsourced, et cetera. But the businesses have to play a role. The other thing that, that I'm talking about in an area where there's a lot of uh, restaurants and it's a very congested area, delivery trucks are there day in and day out. Why don't we bundle our purchasing too? I'm sure all the restaurants are ordering milk from somebody, not special milk, just regular milk, and vitamin D and whole milk. But they're all probably ordering it from different people, so they have delivery trucks coming four or five times a day bringing milk to four or five different people. Why don't they all order it together? They could probably get a cheaper price and only have one truck deliver it and then have them bring it to all of their businesses. We have to think a little bit smarter about the way we're doing things and get that collaboration going as a community. I mentioned the Ohio State Mobility Initiative. That was the group that I put together. And then the Columbus Partnership, let me just talk about them a little bit and how big a help they were. In the, in the Smart City Challenge. One of the members of the Columbus Partnership is the owner of that shopping mall that I was talking about, and he owns some of the private roads there. Huge advocate. All I had to do was go and talk to him, and he was like, yeah, I want to do this, I want to do it tomorrow. How soon can you start? Well, of course, there's a lot of issues, policy-related issues, you can only imagine. So we couldn't do it that quick, but we had his support. And the partnership continued to get all, all of the people together uh, to do this. And by the time we applied for the $50 million grant, we had $90 million in matching funds from um, the private and public sector. Because the partnership is so integral and has continued to support a number of the initiatives, that matching fund has now gone to nearly $500 million. And the mayor wants to have $1 billion by 2020. And I'm sure we'll make it. It's not all cash. A lot of it is services. A lot of it is in kind. But nonetheless, it's that kind of public-private uh, partnership that is, that, required, that is required and allowed us to get the monetary funds to make it happen. And I can't say enough about the triple helix. Getting industry, government, and academia to work together. 
It's the way that we were able to put together the proposal. We were able to then create the statement of work, the con ops, and all the other elements that have allowed us to continue to progress um, as we've gone through winning the grant. And I have to say, you know, when we were writing the proposal, we were all housed together and we had, you know, documents all over the wall and sticky notes everywhere and all kinds of ideas. And we worked and we worked and we worked and we promoted it. And the mayor was with us and we went to Washington and had our big proposal. And then we won. It was like, oh yeah, we won. We did it. We were so excited. And then about a week later we said, oh my God, how are we going to manage this? So let me explain. The city was not ready to manage a $50 million grant. It's not something cities normally do. So we actually worked together and put together the organization to make it happen. We brought in a chief innovation officer because this grant's four years. We want to be smart for many, many years. And we need to make sure that those things that we're doing in the pilots today are going to have the, the legs to last out for 70, 80 years further. So that chief innovation officer needs to be thinking about that long term. We had to bring in the right kind of program management. We had to bring in the right kind of engineers. And we actually had to create an actual smart Columbus program office. We tried to do it at first out of, uh, out of a different department, and that didn't really proceed well. So we had a lot to learn. And you know, if there's any advice that I can give you know, for the, the cities who want to do this, think about your structure and think about who's going to lead it. Those cities that are doing really well have their own innovation team that is leading the initiative for the city. At your table, uh, you should have a card and we ask if you, you know, as, as we saw from, from Carla, as we've said all day, this is about building a coalition that believes that we can be a place where every resident can easily and affordably move from where they are to where they need to be across the upstate region. But we need your help. We need you involved. Whether it be in providing input, we're going to have some stakeholder meetings, um, or being engaged on the steering committee, um, being a, a financial funding partner for this initiative, um, any and or all of those ways, we hope you will engage. Please com complete this and, and leave it at your table or give it to Tiffany um, as, as you leave or um, we'll collect it uh, today. Um, and, and lastly, I wanna thank our funding partners who were part of this effort. Again, Duke Energy, Clemson University, um, the Upstate Alliance, and then all the other partners who are, are listed who have made a, a commitment. And I think that's what makes this initiative a little bit different for a lot of us. You know, we've done things, and many others have, where we engage a lot of partners from the, the public sector and the private sector, um, but most of the funding we secure from one or two places, and we're certainly, you know, need funding from um, the traditional sources for this initiative, but most of the partners are putting their own investment and are, are committing to being part of this effort financially, and that's critical as we move forward. It shows that they aren't just, you know, engaged in a little way, they're engaged or invested in this initiative. And, and as we've seen and we've said, you know, if we keep doing the same things over and over and expect a different result, we'll be sitting here in five years or 10 years or 15 years talking about all these problems and what we've got to start doing. So now's the time to start doing things differently. And I believe that, you know, we have so many great things going on in the upstate region. And if we can just harness all those together and move forward collectively, Everybody doing their piece, but doing it as part of, of understanding where we're going and what our goals are, I think we can be very successful as an upstate. So I appreciate all of you for being here and being part of this, and I really hope you will continue to be engaged. Before we finish, I have to, and I think she might have left the room, I've got to say thank you to Tiffany Tate, our uh, assistant director, uh, who has been absolutely amazing in this effort. If she's out in the hallway, I hope she would come in. There she is. Uh, please give her a hand.
Tiffany put all this together and has been tremendous, and so we thank her. But again, if you can stay, please do um, for the, the session with Carla. If not, please stay engaged, be part of this. If we work together, we're stronger, and we can help continuing to move the upstate forward. So thank you for being here, and um, look forward to working with you moving forward.